It seems increasingly likely that I will undertake the expedition that has been preoccupying my imagination now for some days. Various questions concerning arrangements here in the house need to be settled, but all in all, I see no genuine reason why I should not undertake this trip. I have written to Miss Kenton to inform her I might be passing by. The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro Dramatised by James Friel With Ian McDermott as Stevens, Julia Ford as Miss Kenton and Oliver Ford Davis as Lord Darlington. Episode 1 Darlington Hall I am most conscious that as I depart for my journey to the West Country, Darlington Hall will stand empty for probably the first time this century. And yet the idea for such a trip comes from a most kind suggestion of my employer, Mr. Faraday, an American gentleman from the Midwest who purchased Darlington Hall from its previous owner to whose family it had belonged for many centuries. Stevens? I was in the library dusting their portraits when my employer entered. Oh, this place is a labyrinth. I am certain, sir, you will come to know the house better in time. Does it ever stop raining here? Well, sir. I've just finalized my plans to return to the States. I won't be here again until uh, September. Very good, sir. Who are all these guys? These are uh, the previous incumbent's ancestors, sir. They required dusting. Mm, they require a good wash. You know, Stevens, I, I don't expect you to uh, be locked up here while I'm gone. Take the four. Go off. Drive somewhere for a few days. You sure look like you need a break. <laughs> you butler fellows, always locked up in these big houses. You never get to see this great country of yours. It has been my privilege to see the best of England, sir, within these very walls. Yeah, maybe. But take my advice, Stevens. Get out of the house for a few days. I'll foot the bill for the gas. Huh. Sir. Yeah, yes, yeah, Stevens? If I may, sir, indeed, with your permission, journey to the West Country. Great. Now you're talking. There is a former housekeeper resident in that region. Oh, my, my Stevens. A lady friend? At your age, you old dog. Sir. <laughs> Should I be helping you with such a dubious assignation? Sir. I was joshing you, Stevens. Uh, bantering? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Bantering. You know about bantering? You have informed me of it previously, sir. It is a skill I am endeavouring to acquire. I believe Miss Kenton may help with a little staffing problem. Will it result in better toast? Sir? That god-awful toast, Stevens. I believe Miss Kenton will ensure a much smoother running of the house. Mm. She was housekeeper here before the war, and Miss Kenton, with her great affection for Darlington Hall, mm. her exemplary professionalism, is of a sort almost impossible to find these days. Mm -hmm. Her sudden availability... You do sound very hot on the subject of Miss Kenton. Sir? Are you sure your interest is entirely professional? Sir? <laughs> ah, ha, 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 I see, sir. You are bantering again. <laughs> well, I'll do what you think best. And take the car. Have a break. If it was most presumptuous of me to raise the subject of additional staff, it was Miss Kenton's letter that prompted me to such boldness. It revealed to me such an unmistakable nostalgia for her time here at Darlington Hall, and I am certain a distinct hint of her desire to return. I should say that Miss Kenton is, properly speaking, Mrs. Ben, but I knew her at close quarters only in her maiden years and her letter has given me extra cause for thinking of her as Miss Kenton, since it would seem, sadly, that her marriage is at an end.
I spent my first evening away from Darlington Hall in a comfortable guest house in Salisbury. Just sign the register, Mr. Stevens, please. Uh, and the address. Mm -hmm. You have a lovely car out the front. American, isn't it? Indeed. They have all the money, the Yanks. <laughs> I shall be the envy of the whole street. <laughs> oh, I, I, I see you come from Darlington Hall. Oh, oh dear, Darlington Hall. Is there a problem? Well, yes, a, a Darlington Hall. A, a gentleman like you must be more at home in the, in the Ritz or, oh, I don't know, the, the Dorchester. I will be quite comfortable, I'm sure. Oh, <laughs> Um, this way, Mr. Stevens, sir. Thank you. I, I have a double at the front you can have for, for a single. There's no hot water until supper, and breakfast is at 7.30 till 9. Oh, there, there's no bacon, but I can do you liver. I'm sure that would be quite adequate. Here we are, sir. Not Darlington Hall, but uh, cosy and clean. Mm. That bedspread is pure candlewick, but guests do have the habit of picking it bald. <sighs> the end of the day. In the quiet of this room, I find what really remains of the day is not the first view of Salisbury and its cathedral, but the rolling English landscape through which I have driven all day. When I view this land, I distinctly know why we call this country of ours Great Britain. Wherein does this greatness lie? Wherein does all greatness lie? It is in the very lack of obvious drama or spectacle, its calmness and its restraint. These qualities, and this is not, I think, too vertiginous a leap, also define a great butler. But the factor that truly distinguishes the great butler from the merely extremely competent is dignity. Yes. Dignity. Um, Flight Lieutenant Cooper, presently stationed in Cyprus, sends best wishes to his wife, Muriel, in Leatherhead, and especially requests Anne Shelton. Did you sleep well, Mr. Stevens? I did, yes. And breakfast was excellent. Quite excellent. Oh, coming from the likes of you, Mr. Stevens, that's a real compliment. Mm -hmm. I can tell you fed off the best in the land. Uh, you'll say as much in my guest book, I trust. Mm, certainly. And will you linger long in Salisbury, Mr. Stevens? Or have you matters pressing? I am eager, I think, to go on. There is someone I most wish to see. Oh. <laughs> Miss Kenton arrived at Darlington Hall in the spring of 1922. She arrived with unusually good references for one so young to take up the post of housekeeper. She was most happy at Darlington Hall, a fact she records in her letter to me. I was so fond, Mr. Stevens, of that view from the second floor bedrooms, overlooking the lawns with the downs visible in the distance. On spring evenings, there was a magical quality to it, was there not? I confess, I used to waste many precious minutes standing at those windows, just enchanted by it. And Forgive me if this is a painful memory. But I will never forget that time we both watched your father walking back and forth in front of the summer house, looking down at the ground as though he hoped to find some precious jewel he had dropped there. As it happened, my father had around this time come to the end of his distinguished service and was at something of a loss for work and accommodation. Still a professional of the highest class, he was now in his seventies and much ravaged by arthritis. It seemed a reasonable solution to invite my father to bring his great experience and distinction to Darlington Hall. 
A house stands or falls on its cutlery? Yes, Father. I taught you that. Indeed you did, Father. And that is why I am giving you particular responsibility for the silverware. Father knows the importance of such things. Big place, isn't it? Darlington Hall. Yes, Father. And there is a great deal to do. Ah. There are also the Chinamen. Huh? Who are they? Not who, Father, but what. The Chinamen are porcelain statues of the Ming Dynasty. They stand opposite to all the doors on the ground floor, on guard, as it were. They were a gift from the Chinese ambassador to his lordship's mother on her wedding day, and his lordship is particularly proud of them and most meticulous about their placing. Uh, for example, Father, yes. this particular Chinaman mm -hmm. holds a book, uh -huh. so he is placed opposite the library. Ah. The Chinaman opposite the dining hall holds chopsticks. Uh -huh. The Chinaman with the dagger And is you want me to dust them? With extreme care, Father. They are of the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> Funny little chappies, aren't they? Linen must be aired on the line, Helen, and must be completely dried before ironing. Yes, Miss Kenton. Kenneth. There are 87 ways to fold a napkin, but only 13 are aesthetically pleasing. Right you are, Mr Stevens. Eileen, linen is folded from left to right. Left? Right, Miss Kenton. Father, you will serve with Philip this evening. Very good. Rose, the mirrors in the bathrooms need at least two applications of vinegar and far more elbow grease than you presently apply. Sorry, Miss Kenton. The Limoges Imperial service this evening, Miss Kenton. His Lordship has requested trouble. Roses in the silver bowl, never in the crystal. Sorry, Miss Kenton. What about this vase? Never in a vase. William, that bell will be for you, William. Right you are, Miss Kenton. I'm on my way. William, those spoons, are they quite clean? Clean enough to see your teeth in them. Uh. Um, thank you, William. Father, don't keep his lordship waiting. As I remember, it was one morning, a little while after my father and Miss Kenton had arrived. I had been sitting in my pantry, going through my paperwork, when she came in holding a large vase of flowers and said, Mr. Stevens, I thought these would brighten your parlour. I beg your pardon, Miss Kenton. It seems a pity your room is so dark and cold when it's bright sunshine outside. I thought these flowers would enliven things a little. This is not a room of entertainment. Well, surely there is no need to keep your room so stark and bereft of colour. I am happy to keep distractions to a minimum, Miss Kenton, though I appreciate your thoughts. There was a certain matter I wished to raise with you. Oh, really, Mr. Stevens? I happened to be walking past the kitchen yesterday when I heard you calling someone William. Is that so, Mr. Stevens? May I ask whom you were addressing by that name? Why, Mr. Stevens, I should think I was addressing your father. There are no other Williams in the house, I take it. May I ask you in future to address my father as Mr. Stevens? If you are referring to him to a third party, then you may wish to call him Mr. Stevens Senior to distinguish him from myself. I am most grateful. I am afraid I am not clear what you are saying, Mr. Stevens. If you will consider the situation for a moment, you may come to see the inappropriateness of someone such as yourself talking down to such a one as my father. I am still not clear what you are getting at, Mr. Stevens. You say, someone such as myself, but I am housekeeper here, while your father is the under-butler. He is far more than that. No doubt I have been extremely unobservant. I have observed only that your father was the under-butler and addressed him as such. My father is a figure of unusual distinction from whom you may learn a wealth of things. Were you prepared to be more observant? I am.
am most indebted to you for your advice, but just what marvellous things might I learn from observing your father? I would have thought it obvious to anyone with eyes. But we have already established, have we not, that I am particularly deficient in that respect. I might point out, for instance, that you are still often unsure of what goes where and which item is which. I had a little difficulty on first arriving, but that is surely only normal. If you had observed my father, who arrived a week after you did, you will have seen his house knowledge is perfect. I am sure Mr. Stevens Sr. is very good at his job, but I am very good at mine. I will remember to address your father by his full title in future. If you will please excuse me, Mr. Stevens. Miss Kenton? After this encounter, I was pleased to observe that she went about settling in most impressively. However, some two weeks after our conversation in the pantry, she approached me in the library. Excuse me, Mr. Stevens, but if you are searching for your dustpan, it is out in the hall. I beg your pardon, Miss Kenton. Your dustpan, Mr. Stevens. You left it there. Should I bring it in for you? I have not been using a dustpan. Then forgive me. I naturally assumed you had left it. I would return it myself, but I have to go upstairs now. I wonder, will you remember it? Of course. Thank you for drawing it to my attention. I crossed the hall and picked up the offending item before I understood the full implications. Oh, dear. My father had left the dustpan there. Such trivial slips are liable to befall anyone from time to time, and my irritation soon turned to Miss Kenton for creating such an unwarranted fuss. Then a week later, she came up to me again with a statement she had clearly been rehearsing. I feel most uncomfortable drawing attention to any errors made by your staff, but I am always grateful when you notice any error made by the female staff, so I don't feel too inhibited by pointing out that several pieces of the silver laid out for the dining room still bear clear remains of polish. Thank you, Miss Kenton. Not at all. One fork was particularly black. It had been unnecessary for her to point out that the silver was one of my father's main responsibilities. It is possible there were other instances I no longer remember, but Events reached something of a climax, one grey and drizzly afternoon, when I was in the billiard room attending to Lord Darlington's sporting trophies. Mr. Stevens, was it his lordship's wish that the Chinaman on the upstairs landing be exchanged with the one outside this door? The Chinaman? I fear you are a little confused, Miss Kenton. I am not confused at all, Mr. Stevens. It is my business to know where objects properly belong in this house. The Chinamen have been polished and then replaced incorrectly. Will you care to step out here and observe for yourself? I am occupied at the moment, Miss Kenton, and will attend to the matter presently. Very well. I will await you outside so that this matter might be finalised when you come out. I assume she would after a while see the ludicrousness of her position and leave. She did not. Resolved not to waste further time on account of this childish affair, I contemplated departure via the French windows. A drawback to this plan was the weather, and the fact that one would need to return to the billiard room again to bolt the French windows from the inside. Mr. Stevens, this is the incorrect Chinaman, would you not agree? Miss Kenton, I am very busy. The fact is, Mr. Stevens, all the Chinamen in this house have been dirty for some time. And now they are in the incorrect positions. Will you kindly look at the Chinaman behind you? I am at a loss as to why you should be so concerned with these most trivial errors. Now, if you will kindly... The me... fact is, Mr. Stevens, whatever your father once was, his powers are now greatly diminished. This is what these trivial errors indicate. I am sorry, Mr. Stevens, your father is entrusted with far more than a man of his age can cope with. He should not, for one, be asked to carry heavily laden trays. The way his hands shake is, is nothing short of alarming. And furthermore, Mr. Stevens, and 
I am very sorry to say this, but I have noticed your father's nose. Have you indeed? The evening before last, I am afraid I observed clearly a large drop on the end of his nose, dangling over the soup bowls. I would not have thought such a style of waiting a great stimulant to the appetite. Now that I think further, I am not certain Miss Kenton spoke quite so boldly. In fact, now I come to think of it, I have a feeling it may have been Lord Darlington himself who made that last particular remark. For later that week, my father, serving tea in the summer house to Lord Darlington and two guests, fell. <laughs> scattering the load on his tray over Lord Darlington and his guests. My father was unconscious for a while. A doctor was called. Lord Darlington asked me for a word. His lordship was, whatever is said of him now, essentially of a shy and modest nature. None of us wish to see anything of this sort happen ever again, do we? I mean, your father collapsing and all that. Indeed not, sir. It could happen, say, during dinner, while your father was waiting at table. The way his hands shake is nothing short of alarming. And furthermore, Stevens, and I am very sorry to say this, I have noticed your father's nose. Sir. The evening before last, I'm afraid I observed clearly a large drop on the end of his nose dangling over the soup bowls. Not a great stimulant to the appetite, is it, Stevens? I am deeply sorry, sir. I would make haste to amend these matters, sir. Look here, Stevens, it's simply that the first of the delegates will be arriving here in less than a fortnight. What happens in this house could have considerable repercussions, I mean considerable repercussions, on the whole course Europe is taking. I do not exaggerate. No, sir. Of course not, sir. There's no question of your father leaving. You're simply being asked to reconsider his duties. My difficulty was compounded by the fact that for some years my father and I had tended, for some reason I never really fathomed, to converse less and less. Since the death of my brother Leonard, there had been between us an air of mutual embarrassment. In the end, I judged it best to talk to him in his own room. I recall the impression of the time, so small and stark it was, of having stepped into a prison cell. I am here to relate something to you, Father. Then relate it briefly. I haven't all morning to listen to your chatter. In that case, Father, I will come to the point. Do so. Principally, it has been felt that Father should no longer be asked to wait at table. I've waited at table for the last 54 years. Furthermore, it has been decided that Father should not carry laden trays of any sort, even the shortest distance. I have listed here the revised round of duties he will from now on be expected to perform. Father, here is the list. Father, I shall leave it here on the end of your bed. I only fell because of them steps onto the lawn. Indeed. They're crooked. Well, Father... Good morning. Those steps should be put right before the gentlemen from Europe start arriving. Yes, indeed. Well, good morning, Father. The spring evening referred to in Miss Kenton's letter came very soon after this encounter. It was late in the day, and sunlight was coming through the open doorways on the second floor landing and falling across the corridor in orange shafts and... There she was, Miss Kenton, a silhouette against the window. Mr. Stevens? Miss Kenton? Come and look. What is it, Miss Kenton? Down there. It's your father, Mr. Stevens. Isn't that where he fell? Yes, it is. What's he doing? What is he looking at? The step, Miss Kenton, on which he tripped. He believes they are crooked. It's as if he is looking for something. 
a jewel they might have dropped. We did not often have time to stand and stare, we too, Mr. Stevens, although the view across to the downs was so very fine. It was hard work we did. At our best, we worked as a team, did we not, Mr. Stevens? I look back to my days at Darlington Hall as amongst the very happiest of my life. The years ahead seem empty to me now. I have no notion how to fill them. I would so much like to be useful again. I was well progressed on my journey across the West Country and had just crossed the border into Dorset when I became aware of a heated smell emanating from the engine and the most curious knocking. Fortunately, a garage was in sight and a cheery mechanic stepped out to greet me. Water, Gov? Uh, yes, I expect so. You want some water in that radiator? I'll top you up. Thank you, my man. Go for? Cornwall. A village called Little Compton. Well, flash motor to get you there. Get you there in no time, that will. There you go. Ah. Try it again. I am much obliged. I'll cut you down. I beg your pardon. I know what you are. I am afraid I don't understand. I couldn't make it out for a while, what with a car and all. And how you talk almost like a gentleman. You're one of them top-notch butlers. Where do you work then? I am situated at Darlington Hall. No, oh, Lord Darlington's gaff. Him? You mean you actually work for Darlington? I am employed by Mr. John Faraday, an American who bought the house from the Darlington family. But you'd have been with Lord Darlington before that. Eh? Thank you so much for your assistance. Nice. I must oh, yeah. be on my way now. Thank you again. I'm in a great hurry. Have you never been himself after I found out he was a trainer? His lordship is now much misunderstood. Lord Darlington, as I knew him, was a quiet, private man. His inclination was to be solitary, bookish, and yet his conscience was so keen that despite this, he acted upon the world stage. He was prompted, I must insist, not out of political ambition, for whatever is said about him now, he was not personally ambitious, but out of honour. He was not moved by power, but fellow feeling. Ah, Stevens. Your whiskey, sir. Thank you, Stevens. Do you know, I've been in the most melancholy mood all day. I'm most sorry to hear this, sir. I've had news of Herr Bremen. You won't remember him, perhaps. Uh, most certainly, sir. He first visited Darlington Hall shortly after the war. You were both, I remember, still in uniform. He was once a regular visitor here, sir. He was my particular friend, Stevens. My particular friend. The years have not been kind to him. Do you remember when he was last here? He was so thin, so very thin and warm. So perhaps he was unwell, some serious illness, perhaps. It is Europe who is sick. This treaty. We're driving Germany into the ground. Men like Herr Bremen with it. This letter came this morning. News of his death. Before. There's a most horrible letter. The good that was between us is gone. And there's only a howl of rage at what the world and what we have done to him and to his country. That is most distressing for you, sir. This is not why I fought in the war, to take part in a vendetta against the German race, but to preserve justice in the world. Now, you won't understand all this, Stevens, but something must be done. I spent all day thinking what must be done, what it is that I must do. I am certain that if there is something to be done, 
His lordship will see that it is done. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, if you would, please leave me now. Yes, sir. of course, sir. In the weeks that followed, powerful and famous gentlemen became regular visitors to the house. Lord Daniels, Mr. Maynard Keynes, and Mr. H.G. Wells, the renowned author, and many others who came off the record, and whom I cannot name even now. They would stay locked in discussion for hours. Fair play was not done at Versailles. The war was over. And the Germans lost. We won. How fair did we have to be to the damn Germans? We broke them into pieces. Uh, Sir David? Oh, we certainly exacted our revenge. Thank you. We gave their rich industrial states to France, and gave Silesia to Poland, we took away their colonies and decimated their army and their navy. We stabbed them in the back. And then we landed them with a hefty reparations bill. Which they have not paid. Which they cannot pay. It is immoral to punish a nation for a war that is now over. It is also economically unwise. Inflation in Germany is at historic levels. Germany is in such chaos, a decline might spread with alarming rapidity to the world at large. To say nothing of honor, which is everything to an Englishman. He succeeded in gathering a broad alliance of figures who shared his convictions with a view to conducting an unofficial conference. It will be a symposium, a gathering of the best and most sympathetic minds in Europe. We already have a broad alliance, willing to attend our conference, but the French... As ever. Hmm? <laughs> ...are the most intransigent as regards releasing Germany from the cruelties of the Versailles Treaty. The French did well out of the Versailles Treaty. They have no reason to release Germany from a contract that has seen them extend their own border and fill up their coffers. And so we must find, gentlemen, at least one Frenchman with an unambiguous influence over his country. That gentleman was ultimately secured. An extremely illustrious gentleman to whom we referred as Monsieur Dupont. Darlington Hall was to witness many events of equal gravity in the years that followed March 1923. But I regard the conference of March 1923 as a turning point in my life. It was when I truly became of age as a butler. I had my part to play in this great world drama, and my part was not without significance, as I made clear to the staff when I called them together for what I believe in the military is called a pep talk. <coughs> There are some 18 very distinguished gentlemen and two ladies who will bring with them secretaries, valets, interpreters, and they must be assured of impeccable service. The smallest lapse, an unironed sheet, Helen. Yes, Mr. Stevens. A less than immaculate piece of cutlery, Graham. Yes, Mr. Stevens. The least hesitation in carrying out a request, Kenneth. Mr. Stevens? could have serious repercussions. There must be a complete vigilance to the needs of his lordship's guests. They are engaged in greatness, and in serving them, so are we. You must take great pride in discharging your duties over the days that lie ahead. History could well be made under this roof. Now, dismiss. Miss Kenton, I wonder if I may draw your attention to the fact that the bed linen for the upper floor will need to be ready the day after tomorrow. The matter is perfectly under control, Mr. Stevens. May I say, if only I had as much spare time as you evidently do, then I would happily reciprocate by wandering about this house, reminding you of tasks you have perfectly well in hand. Perhaps the tension of the coming days is affecting you, Miss Kenton. 
your great inexperience of events. You are such perpetually as... talking of my great inexperience, and yet you appear quite unable to point out any defect in my work. Otherwise, I have no doubt you would have done so long ago at some length. In fact, Mrs. Stevens, I would ask you from now on not to speak to me directly at all. Miss Kemp. If it is necessary to convey a message, do so through a messenger, or else you may like to write a note and have it sent to me. Now, I am extremely busy. I must return to my work and leave you to your wanderings. Miss Kenton, this is unpardonable behaviour. A note, if you please, Mr. Stevens. Oh, Stevens, I, I realize this is a somewhat irregular thing to do. Sir? It's just that one has so much of importance on one's mind just now. I would be very glad to be of assistance, sir. You are familiar, I take it, with the facts of life. Sir? Birds, bees, you are familiar, aren't you? I'm... I'm afraid I don't quite follow you, sir. Sir David Cardinal is a very old friend, and he's been invaluable in setting up this conference. Invaluable, but he has his funny side. He, he's brought his son to act as secretary. The point is, he's engaged to be married. Young Reginald, I mean. And Sir David has been attempting to tell his son the facts of life for the last five years. And the son is now 23. I happen to be the young man's godfather, and so Sir David has requested that I convey to young Reginald the facts. I see, sir. The point is, Stevens, I'm terribly busy. Do I understand that you wish me to convey the facts of life to the young gentleman. Of course, this is beyond the call of duty. I will do my best, sir. Ah. Now, are Monsieur Dupont's rooms prepared? Indeed, sir. The fate of this conference, indeed, of Europe, hangs on our ability to bring him round. I am aware of the significance, sir, and I am proud to play my part. Good man. As to young Reggie, just convey the basic facts. The simple approach is best. I found young Mr. Cardinal in the library and took time from my many other duties to speak with him. France, English <coughs> industrial states, Silesia, high inflation. <coughs> yes? Excuse me, sir. But I have a message to convey to you. From father? Yes, sir. That is, effectively. Then far away, Stevens. <clears throat> Your father wishes you to know that ladies and gentlemen differ in several key respects. I am aware of that. I've done extensive reading and background work on this whole area. In fact, I've thought about nothing else for months. In that case, my message is rather redundant. You can assure Father that I'm very well briefed indeed. I really think I have thought through every permutation the human mind is capable of. This attaché case is chock full of notes on every possible angle. That's why I never let go of it. Imagine if the wrong person opened it. Mm, that would be most awkward, sir. Unless Father has come up with an entirely new factor, I cannot imagine he has, sir. I was collecting my thoughts for a renewed effort, but was interrupted by the arrival, some two days early, of Mr. Lewis, the American senator. I remember passing Miss Kenton and inquiring who it was that had arrived. A message, please, Mr. Stevens, if it is urgent. This was extremely annoying. The United States doesn't mind admitting that mistakes were made at Versailles. But the French are more intransigent. One thing you can bet on is that Monsieur Dupont hates the Germans 
with a depth a gentleman like you cannot understand. We English also fought the Germans long and hard. Uh, their landscape still bears the scars of their battle with Germany, while yours, your lordship, does not. Or perhaps we have a different way of looking at things from the French. Oh, a kind of temperamental difference, you might say. Mr. Lewis, you may call it a temperamental difference, but I venture we're talking about something more. It is unbecoming to go on hating an enemy like this once the conflict is over. Mm. Once you have your man on the canvas, you don't proceed to kick him. It is barbarous. Mm. It's not sporting, no. Darlington Hall was filled with people of all nationalities talking in rooms, intent on courting one another and forming alliances. A tense atmosphere, characterized largely by distrust, seemed to prevail. Monsieur Dupont had yet to arrive, but we were well prepared for him. Graham, I wish to be informed instantly of Monsieur Dupont's arrival. Yes, Mr. Stevens. What is that? On the fingers of your gloves. Uh, newsprint, Mr. Stevens. I was ironing the Herald Tribune for Mr. Lewis. Change your gloves immediately. You should know better, Graham. Quickly, I will wait here till you return. And, Graham, the fire in the library? Uh, roaring nicely, Mr. Stevenson. And the one in the study, and the one in the music room, and the... Very good. Now change your gloves. Kenneth. Mr. Stevens. Herr von Stressmann has ordered cocoa. Ensure it arrives in his room without a skin. Yes, Mr. Stevens. And, Kenneth, the Baroness has brought her chihuahuas. Oh, no. I've seen them, ugly little blighters. That is of no consequence. They are, however, prone to incontinence. Be on your guard at all times. Now, go along. While waiting, I noticed young Mr. Cardinal in the garden, and I was reminded of my mission. <coughs> oh, Stevens, you gave me a fright. If you will pardon me, sir. Yes? I have something to convey to you. You will notice the geese, sir. And likewise, the flowers and the shrubs. Well, I'm afraid I haven't been paying much attention to the glories of nature, or with the conference and everything. I'm more of a fish man myself. Fish and fresh water. All living things will be relevant to our discussion, sir. Speaking of birds, that Monsieur Dupont is a queer bird. He arrived in a most foul mood. Monsieur Dupont has arrived. I must attend him straight away. I'm afraid our discussion will have to wait for another occasion. Oh, I look forward to it. Please excuse me, sir. Monsieur Dupont was not in good temper. Oh, I have walked about London till my feet. They have bled, I fear, they grow septic. Butler, 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 I am in need of bandages. At once, sir. Henri, mon bon ami, how are you? Ah, uh, Joseph, we meet again. I am sadly dying of my feet. Butler, I need bandages. Senator Lewis and Monsieur Dupont were to be seen for much of the remainder of the day in close company. Their proximity a serious inconvenience to Lord Darlington, for Monsieur Dupont held the key to the outcome of the following day. I need my feet changed. I had just changed his dressings for the third time that day when Miss Kenton approached me. Mr. Stevens, I'm sorry to inform you that your father has been taken ill upstairs. Father! I have a little more time than you at the moment. I shall, if you wish, attend your father and have already called the doctor. Thank you, Miss Kenton. But Obliged. Butler, we'll be back into the conference room. Certainly, sir. Monsieur Dupont demanded a great deal of my attention and it was because of this I chanced to overhear a certain conversation. I was just about to knock on Monsieur Dupont's door, but before doing so, as is my custom, and a common practice amongst many professionals, I paused to listen at the door. Quite frank, Henri, I was appalled at their attitude toward your countrymen. Even now, behind your back, I have heard them described as barbarous and uh, despicable. Je le sais, c'est anglais. 
C'est toujours la même. I don't know that you should trust any of them. I don't, Mr. Lewis. I don't. I, of course, informed Lord Darlington immediately. Thank you, Stevens. Fine work. This is bad form on Lewis's part. Very bad. Indeed, sir. In the meantime, Miss Kenton informed me that my father's condition had worsened. But it was not until the second evening of the conference that I had occasion to visit him. I hope father is feeling better now. Is everything in hand downstairs? Well, I can imagine the situation in the kitchen. But is everything in hand? The situation is rather volatile. Son. I'm very glad father is feeling better. Now I really must be getting back. I hope I've been a good father to you. I'm so glad father is feeling better. I've never said it. I, I really must be getting back. I, 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 I'm glad father is feeling better. I'm proud of you. A good son. Father can imagine how busy we are. I hope I've been a good father to you. As I say, the situation is very volatile. Uh, I suppose I haven't. I'm so glad you're feeling better now. Father? It was a memorable sight to see the banqueting hall employed to full capacity on that last evening of the conference. The mood had changed, and the company had lost much of its reserve. We found ourselves serving wine at a conspicuously increased rate, and Lord Darlington, not a natural public speaker, made a speech that was met most warmly. Discussions have been exhilaratingly frank, but conducted in a spirit of friendship and the desire to see good prevail. Here, here. Now I ask you now to rise and drink to peace and justice in Europe. Peace and justice in Europe. Excellent speech. But have we won him over, Dupont? <laughs> Dear God, it's Dupont. What is he going to say? Hold fast, dear boy. I think we've got him. If we haven't, then all of this has been in vain. No one has yet given a toast in thanks to our host, the most honorable and kind Lord Darlington. I came principally to listen. And let me say I have been impressed by certain of the arguments I have heard here. But... How impressed, hmm? you may be asking. I shall tell you. Oh, God. I am happy to assure you all that I will bring what modest influence I have to encourage changes in emphasis in French policy in accordance with much of what has been said here. And I will endeavor to do so at the highest level. <laughs> but... Just as there is an imperative to publicly express gratitude to Lord Darlington, there is, I believe, an imperative to openly condemn any who came here to sow discontent and suspicion. I refrain from outlining just what Mr. Lewis... Yes, Mr. Lewis, oh, I name him, Lord. has been saying to me about you all and with a clumsy technique, audacity, and crudeness. But enough of condemnations. It is time for us to raise our glasses to Lord Darlington. Well, since everyone's giving speeches, I may as well take a turn. Now we're all being frank. I'll be frank, too. You gentlemen here are just a bunch of 
dreamers. If you didn't insist on meddling in large affairs that affect the globe, you would actually be charming. Now let us take our good host here. Decent, honest, well-meaning. An amateur. Sit down, sir. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Are no longer for amateurs. He meddles in business he does not understand. The days when you could act out of noble instincts are over. Shame. 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 You need uh, professionals to run your affairs. You are heading for disaster. A toast to professionalism. Sit down. I have no wish to enter a quarrel, sir. But what you describe as amateurism, sir, most of us here still prefer to call honor. Yeah, yeah. That's well said. If by professionalism you mean cheating and manipulating, ordering one's priorities by greed and self-interest, I don't care for it, and I have no wish to acquire it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Stevens. Not now, Graham. No. The gentlemen are about to retire. Well, it's <laughs> urgent, Mr. Stevenson. Well, it still must wait. The gentlemen are about to retire. It's Miss Kenton. She wants an urgent word with you. I've called for the doctor, Mr. Stevens, and he is on his way. Your father is in a very poor state. You must come now, Mr. Stevens or else you may deeply regret it later. This is most distressing. The gentlemen are likely to retire at any moment. Of course, Mr. Stevens. You understand? I do. I will tell you when there are any changes. I say, Stevens, you're interested in fish. Fish, sir. You know what we were talking about before. I thought you were going to tell me the facts of life. Not that you need to, good heavens. And then it occurred to me you were just bantering. Uh, I see, sir, yes. Bantering, yes. Ah. I say, are you all right? Quite all right, thank you. Stevens, are you all right? Yes, sir. Perfectly. You look as though you're crying. Perhaps it is the cigar smoke, sir. Butler! Yes, sir? I wonder if you would find me fresh bandages. My feet are unbearable once again. I will attend to it immediately, sir. Please do. I am in agony. Miss Kenton was in the hall as I emerged and stopped me as I passed. A curious lack of urgency in her manner. Mr. Stevens, I'm very sorry. Your father passed away four minutes ago. I see. I am very sorry. Thank you. I wish there was something I could say. There's no need, Miss Kenton. Will you come up and see him? In a little while, perhaps. You see... Yes, Mr. Stevens? He would have wished me to carry on. Of course, Mr. Stevens. To do otherwise, I feel, would be to let him down. Yes, of course, Mr. Stevens. Butler, have you seen to my arrangements? As it happens, sir, there is a doctor on the way. You call the doctor? Yes, sir. Good. Good. Excellent. In time, Miss Kenton and I ascended through the house in silence. He looks very peaceful, does he not, Mr. Stevens? Yes, Miss Kenton. He does. The doctor said he suffered a severe stroke. If it's any comfort to you, I was here, and he passed away very quietly. I'm very grateful, Miss Kenton. 
How pleasant that you were so close. Close? Together, at the end, I mean. That you were both employed here in these, his final days. Our profession does not often allow such fortune. One chooses life or work, it sometimes feels. Were you his only son, Mr. Stevens? I mean, are there other family members to inform us? I would be most happy to assist. No, I am the only extant relative. There was... I did have a brother, Leonard. He was killed in the South African War while I was still a boy. Father was most upset. I am sorry to hear that, Mr. Stevens. My father felt the loss of my brother keenly. The matter was made worse by the notion that his son's sacrifice was sullied by the fact that my brother perished in a particularly infamous manoeuvre. My brother died quite needlessly. How very sad, Mr. Stevens. How very sad it all is. Sad? Yes, I suppose it must seem so, but... That is not why I recall the event, Miss Kenton. You see, there were calls for the removal, even the court-martialing of the general concerned. Some ten years after the conflict, this very same general came to visit my father's employer. My father's feelings towards the general were of the utmost loathing. Yet so well did father hide his feelings... So professionally did he carry out his duties that on his departure the general complimented Mr. Silver on the excellence of his butler. Dignity, you see, Miss Kenton. Yes, Mr. Stevens, I do see that. Dignity, Miss Kenton. Dignity has to do crucially with the butler's ability not to abandon the professional being he inhabits. He will not be shaken by external events. Then you are your father's son, Mr. Stevens. I believe I am. If you will excuse me, Miss Kenton, there is work to do downstairs. You may think I delude myself if I go so far as to suggest that I also displayed the dignity, at least in some modest degree, worthy of a great butler, such as my father. The conference had been a great success, and I had played my part by serving my master. For all its sad associations, whenever I recall that evening, I find I do so with a large sense of triumph. Ishiguro. Lord Darlington's butler, Stevens, has resolved to make a journey to the West Country to find his former housekeeper, Miss Kenton. The journey evokes memories of a life half-lived and many mistakes made in the years between two world wars. At the gracious behest of my present employer, I have taken a few days away from my demanding work as butler at Darlington Hall. My intention is to visit a Miss Kenton former housekeeper at Darlington Hall. The Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro Dramatised by James Friel With Ian McDermott as Stevens, Julia Ford as Miss Kenton and Oliver Ford Davis as Lord Darlington Episode 2, Miss Kenton. She is now a Mrs. Ben, most unhappily married and recently separated, and living in the West Country. I have made, however, a slight detour to the village of Mersden in Somerset. Mersden is where the firm of Giffin and Company was once situated. Giffin and Company manufactured polish. Dark candles of polish. 
to be flaked, mixed into wax, and applied by hand. The historic significance of Giffen and Company's polish cannot be underestimated. I remember making this point to Mr. Graham, the under-butler. Giffen's polish appeared ten years ago, Mr. Graham, at the beginning of the twenties. Is that so, Mr. Stevenson? It is so. And I am not alone in closely associating its emergence with that change of mood within our profession that has come to push the polishing of silver to a position of central importance. Why is that, Mr. Stevens? No other object in the house is likely to come under such intimate scrutiny from outsiders as its silver. During a meal, for example. It is the public index of a house's standards. I heard Lady Astor say as our silver was unrivaled. And she remarked it not without a certain bitterness. Her own butler, Mr. Joris, is not, I am sad to say, among the very great butlers. Another admirer of our silver was, crucially, Lord Halifax, a cabinet minister. I don't know, Darlington. There'll be hell to pay if this meeting gets out. Shortly afterwards, to become foreign secretary. A member of the cabinet in secret meetings with the ambassador of a foreign power? Herr Ribbentrop is, I'm convinced, a true ally. He has no wish to cause tension or a rift between Germany and ourselves. Together, you and Ribbentrop could form a significant alliance in the interests of this country. It was not an easy meeting. Lord Darlington was most anxious to secure Lord Halifax's support in creating a more peaceful union with the new Germany, and Lord Halifax was proving most reluctant. Conversation at the dinner table was strained until at one point I overheard Lord Halifax exclaim, oh, Goodness, Darlington, the silver in this house is an absolute delight. His lordship assured me that this put Lord Halifax in a very different frame of mind. So it is not simply my fantasy that the state of the silver made a small but significant contribution to the easing of Anglo-German relationships in those years before the war. My employer did nothing unusual in either giving or receiving hospitality from the Nazis in those years, and it needs to be said that it is salacious nonsense to claim that Lord Darlington was anti-Semitic. Any allegation that his lordship refused admittance to Jewish guests or refused to employ Jewish staff is utterly unfounded, except, perhaps, in respect to one very minor episode in the 30s. Here's your man. Ask him. Stevens, must I really care? Yes, you must, darling. Otherwise, you will inadvertently offend many of the people with whom you wish to find favor. I am absolutely serious and say this as a friend. Stevens? Yes, sir? Mrs. Barnett and I have been discussing the... Jewish problem. Indeed, sir. A cucumber sandwich, madam. No. Caroline, is this really necessary? Only last week I was with Sir Oswald Mosley when he spat out a cucumber sandwich on realizing it had been prepared by a Jew. I have even seen a German attaché become physically sick in the presence of a Jewish maitre d', and the food had yet to be served. These Yids have a very different attitude to hygiene. That sounds a bit too strong to me, I must say. Obviously, I don't feel this way, but the people you wish to persuade do. You are keen on getting the lovely von Ribbentrop on board, aren't you? Well, yes, of course. And do you really wish to offend the very people whose support you have worked so hard to gain? They are terribly warm on the subject. I say this for your own good, for the good of the cause. Stevens, do we have any on the staff at the moment? Jews, I mean? I believe two of the present staff members would fall into that category, sir. German girls, sir. Miss Kenton employed them from an agency that specializes in the placing of foreign labor. Oh, I've heard of such agencies. Fifth columnist, the lot of them finding jobs for Jews when our own workforce lies idle. Then I am afraid you will have to let them go. Sir? We cannot have 
Jews on the staff here at Darlington Hall. For the good of the house, Stevens. In the interests of the guests we have staying here. Well, quite. It's regrettable, but it seems we have no choice. Very well, sir. That evening, I raised the subject when I met for Coco in Miss Kenton's parlour. But Ruth and Sarah have been members of my staff for more than a year. They have served this house excellently. Does it not occur to you that to dismiss them on these grounds would be simply wrong? His Lordship has made the decision, Miss Kenton. Well, then I will go too. Miss Kenton. I will not continue to work in such a house. I will not. I... I cannot. It is wrong. Do you really mean to question his Lordship's conduct? You see that he is involved in affairs of great import in the running of the world, Miss Kenton. He sees a far bigger picture than is available to the likes of you and I. Our role in life is to support him, not to question him. It is for us to serve and to do his bidding. This, Miss Kenton, is his bidding. <laughs> Naturally, Ruth, Sarah, we bid you farewell with a heavy heart. Miss Kenton is particularly sad to see you leave, are you not, Miss Kenton? I am sadder than I can say, Mr. Stevens. We have been bad. No, not at all. Oh, then why? Why we go when we are good girls who work hard? Because... Because... Mr. Stevens, can you tell them why? For I cannot do this. We will work harder, Mr. Stevens. Oh, yes, so hard we will work. You will have no complaints. We have no complaints about your work. On the contrary, you will leave here with the highest of recommendations. Oh, but Mr. Stevens, Miss Kenton, we Perhaps have... you will go home and find work there. <laughs> Having work here at Darlington Hall, you will be much sought after. Where is home? Home is Berlin. We cannot go back there. We cannot. Why ever not? His lordship has visited Berlin many times. He tells me it is a most charming city. How fortunate you are and how glad you must be to be going home. <laughs> and you will see your families again. Miss Kendall, please do not do this to us. We cannot go home. We cannot. I am afraid that there, there is nothing I can do. His lordship and Mr. Stevens have decided. I am so sorry. You may leave us now, Ruth, Sarah. Write to your parents with the happy news. We do not know where they are. I am sure a correctly addressed envelope will find them. Good morning. <laughs> That was horrible. It was horrible. A year after the dismissal of the two maids, Miss Kenton was still at her post. And his lordship revived the matter one afternoon. Oh, Stevens. Yes, sir. I've been meaning to say about that business last year, about the Jewish maids, it was wrong what occurred. I was misguided, perhaps. I no longer trust Mrs. Barnett, or Sir Oswald and his black shirts. It surprises me I ever did. They're quite crude people, I think, now. Those uh, girls, I suppose there's no way of tracing them? There was not. They seemed to have vanished into the air. But I assumed his lordship's change of heart would be of some interest to Miss Kenton. I discovered her in the summer house, a curious place to be on such a wet day. It's rather funny to remember, but only a year ago you insisted you were going to resign over the matter. It rather amused me to think of it. Had I been worthy of any respect at all, I would have left long ago. Where could I have gone? I have no family, only my aunt. I love her dearly, but I can't live with her for a day without feeling my whole life is wasting away. I just saw myself going out into the world and finding nobody who knew or cared about me. It was cowardice, Mr. Stevens. 
Simple cowardice. I just thought you'd like to know, since I recall you were as distressed by the episode as I was. I'm sorry, Mr. Stevens, I don't understand you. The whole matter caused me great concern. Very great concern. Then why did you not tell me so at the time? Do you realize how much it would have meant to me if you had thought to share your feelings last year? Why, Mr. Stevens? Why, why, why do you always have to pretend? Pretend, Miss Kenton? I suffered so much over Ruth and Sarah leaving us. And I suffered all the more because I believed I was alone. She said nothing more but gazed out of the view. The summer house had by now grown so dark all I could see of her was her profile outlined against the pale and rainy background. I could think of nothing more to say, and so I left her there. This episode calls to mind a curious corollary to that whole affair, namely the arrival of the housemaid called Lisa. We both interviewed her for the post. I know it looks bad. I've never worked anywhere for long, and I did leave my last place of work unhappily. And yes, without a reference, but I work hard. I do. I want to make something of my life. I must look to myself. I know that now. There's only me, you see. Thank you. Will you please wait outside? That girl will turn out well, Mr. Stevens. You will see. I was dubious, but Miss Kenton seemed to have a particular interest in the girl, and she was, in the first instance, proved right. You appear to have had a modest success with that girl. Modest? She has proven to be exceptional. And look at that smile on your face, Mr. Stevens. It appears whenever I mention Lisa. You are talking nonsense, Miss Kenton. Might it be Mr. Stevens' fierce distraction? Can it be that our Mr. Stevens is flesh and blood after all? I was proved right, I am sad to say. The girl all of a sudden announced her intention to marry the second underfootman. We don't have money, but who cares? We have love. And who wants anything else? We've got each other. That's all anyone wants at the end of the day. Naturally, we wish you both well. There is no need to serve out your notice. We are happy for you to leave forthwith. Good day. Lisa? Yes, Miss Kenton? Are you sure you are doing the wisest thing? I can't say, Miss. But you have to take your chances in life, don't you? She is bound to be disappointed. She might have had a real career. Kenneth would never have risen. Note, Miss Kenton, I have never let him serve at table. In a year or two, I could have had her ready to take on a housekeeper's post in some small residence. Even after I had supervised their scrubbing, I was never confident his fingernails were absolutely clean. And then in a few years, a larger house. Even a house as large as this. This profession is not for everyone. Not everyone has the ambition, the self-sacrifice. And now she's thrown it all away. The discipline. She's bound to be let down. So foolish. Miss Kenton, of course, is now a Mrs. Ben, separated and living alone in Cornwall, which will be my journey's end. At this very moment, no doubt, she is pondering with regret a similar decision that has left her deep in middle age, so desolate and alone. No wonder she yearns to return to Darlington Hall. Nowhere in her letter does she state this explicitly, but that is the letter's unmistakable message. Of course, she cannot hope by returning to retrieve those lost years, and it will be my first duty to impress this on her when we meet. This said, our relationship did change somewhat after Lisa's disappearance. I must emphasize I never allowed our relationship to slip into banter or anything that would mar a good working relationship. 
My pantry, for example, was my sanctuary, and she knew not to invade it for frivolous reasons. And yet one evening, she did so. Mr. Stevens? Your room looks less accommodating than a prison cell. The electric bulb is far too dim, surely, for you to be reading by. What are you reading? Simply a book, Miss Kent. I can see that, Mr. Stevens, but what sort of book? That is what interests me. Really, Miss Kenton, I must ask you to respect my privacy. <laughs> but why are you so shy about your book? Is it something racy? I suspect it is. Miss Kenton, I must ask you to leave me alone. Oh, what on earth are you so anxious to hide? I wonder, is it a perfectly respectable volume? Or are you protecting me from its shocking influence? Please, let me see your book. <laughs> Mr. Stevens. Please, Miss Kenton. Good gracious. It isn't anything scandalous at all. It's simply a sentimental love story. Please return it to me, Miss Kenton. A love story. Please. Return it, please. There you are, Mr. Stevens. There is a simple reason for my perusing such works. Such works tend to be written in good English which assists me in the normal intercourse with ladies and gentlemen. You see, Miss Kenton, my interest is professional. I see, Mr. Stevens. I do see that. Yes. What else could it be? Then you will kindly not appear like this and invade my private moments. Of course, Mr. Stevens. I apologise for the intrusion. <laughs> You must understand that I was off duty when Miss Kenton marched in. Any butler who regards his vocation with any pride aspires most of all to dignity. There is one situation and one situation only in which a butler who cares about his dignity may feel free to unburden himself. That is to say, when he is entirely alone. I believe I have run out of petrol. I resolved to set about re-establishing my relationship with Miss Kenton on a more proper, that is to say, professional basis. I observed her closely and noticed that it was about this time that she began suddenly to take full advantage of her contracted time out. It was Mr. Graham, the under-butler, who commented on it. Oh, granted. Never used to. She was like you, Mr. Stevens. Only took it when times were quiet. Broody, I reckon. Broody? Broody, Mr. Stevens. They all get that way. You've surely noticed that. Miss Kenton is a devoted professional. She has no wish for a family. I've been in four houses, Mr. Stevens. Three of them with housekeepers in their mid-thirties, and each of them married soon as she was asked. Up and left the profession for all their devotion. Nonsense. Do this teapot again. There is polish in the spout. I dismissed Graham's theory with confidence, and yet it was hard to keep out of my mind the possibility that the purpose of these mysterious outings of Miss Kenton was to meet a suitor. And I could not help noticing that she had started to get letters on a fairly regular basis from the same correspondent, and that these letters bore a local postmark. I did dare venture to mention them one evening during one of our cocoa sessions. Oh, Mr. Stevens, it's just someone I knew once when I was at Grantchester Lodge. As a matter of fact, he was butler there and very ambitious. No time for anything but his work, made that quite clear. But now he's left service altogether and is employed by a business nearby. He somehow learnt of my being here and started writing to me, suggesting we renew our acquaintance. And that is the long and the short of it. No doubt it is refreshing for you to leave the house at times. I find it so, Mr. Stevens. Is this, um, this acquaintance of mine, Mr. Ben, 
was, as I say, very ambitious. I imagine his ultimate dream would have been to be butler of a house like this one. At this level, Miss Kenton, the profession is not for everyone. It is easy enough to have ambition, but without certain qualities, a butler will simply not progress beyond a certain point. <laughs> it occurs to me you must be a well-contented man, Mr. Stevens. Here you are at the top of your profession, every aspect of your domain well under control. I really cannot imagine what more you wish in life. Indeed, Miss Kenton. Mr. Stevens, is there anything more you wish in life? My vocation will not be fulfilled until I have done all I can to see his lordship through the great tasks he has set himself. I see. Perhaps we could now talk of the coming weekend. It appears to be quite a sizable gathering. Her Ribbentrop is bringing five colleagues from the German Mr. Embassy. Mr. Stevens, I'm rather tired this evening. You are? Yes. Suddenly I'm very tired. You're increasingly tired now, Miss Kenton. Perhaps if we could discuss the linen situation Mr. Stevens, I am very tired. I've had a very busy week and I'm very tired. Can you not appreciate that? If that is how you feel, Miss Kenton, there is no need at all for us to continue. Thank you. With these evening meetings. Mr. Stevens, I merely said I was tired tonight. No, it is perfectly understandable. You have a busy life, and these meetings are quite unnecessary addition to your burden. Mr. Stevens, I merely said... I understand completely. I believe these meetings are very useful. But they are inconvenient to you. May I suggest from now on we simply communicate during the normal course of a working day. Should we not find each other readily, I suggest we leave written messages at one another's doors. Now, Miss Kenton, I apologise for keeping you up so long. Thank you most kindly for the cocoa. I believe I am quite lost. Oh, dear. I suppose this was something of a turning point. When searching one's past, with the benefit of hindsight, one begins to see turning points everywhere. Not only my decision in respect to our cocoa sessions, but also that episode with the novel in my pantry. What would have transpired, one may ask, had one responded slightly differently? And perhaps my encounter with Miss Kenton the morning she received the news of her aunt's death. Miss Kenton? I've had a letter. My aunt died the day before yesterday. Her funeral is to take place tomorrow. I wonder if it is possible to take the day off. I am sure that could be arranged, Miss Kent. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Forgive me, but, but, but perhaps I will withdraw to my room for a short while. Uh, of course. Miss Kenton. I had not offered my condolences. I passed outside her door, wondering if I should knock and make good my omission. But then I might intrude on her private grief. Indeed, it was not impossible that Miss Kenton was, at that very moment, and only a few feet from me, actually crying. The image provoked a strange feeling to rise in me, causing me to stand hovering in the corridor for some moments before I walked away. Please. My car has run out of petrol some miles back, and I would like a room. And a strong drink, too, I reckon. Come in, I was just about to open the bar. And we have a guest looking for a warm room and some good food. And some petrol for my car. Oh, we'll sort you out, sir. Come away. Thank you. Oh, 
No, sir, you're most welcome. Very pleased to have you, sir. I've siphoned off some of my own petrol for your car. Oh, but surely... Oh, no, sir, it is no bother. You can use it tomorrow and drive to the garage in Tavistock. That is very kind of you. Not at all, sir. Not often we have the likes of you come through. This is a small village and the regulars will soon be in to say hello. Did you enjoy your meal, sir? It was most excellent, Mrs. Tobin. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Some coffee, sir? Gentlemen like you would have coffee after his evening meal. Or uh, brandy? <gasps> no, no. This is good British beer and will do me very well. You have both been most kind. <laughs> oh, even said. Annie. Evening. Harry. Usual. Harry, this is Mr. Stevens. How do you do? Ah, uh, you'll be the owner of that car over the back a while yonder. This is a small village, Mr. Stevens. You sneeze here and everybody hears. Absolute <laughs> beauty of a car it is too. But the car Mr. Lindsay used to drive completely in the shade. Mr. Lindsay was the gentleman lived in the big house. He did one or two odd things and wasn't appreciated around here. <laughs> Your health, Mr. Stevens. Uh, good health to you all. Oh. Mr. Lindsay, sir, was no gentleman. May have had a lot of money, but he was no gentleman. We told Dr. Carlyle you was here, sir. The doctor would be very pleased to make your acquaintance. Now he is a gentleman. Yeah, that Mr. Lindsay, he had it all wrong, oh. acting the way he did. Thought he was better than all of us. Right. Well, I can tell you, sir, he soon learned otherwise. <laughs> he had a fine house and good suits, but somehow you just knew. Mm. So it proved in good time. Black marketeer. Exploiting public one in a time of need. Parasite. Prison's too good for him. That's true. That's true what you say. You can't tell a true gentleman from a false one dressed in finery. Take yourself, sir. Not just the cut of your clothes, nor is it the fine way you've got of speaking. There's something else that marks you out as a gentleman. Hard to put a finger on it. What do you suppose it is, sir? What is it makes you a true gent? It is hardly for me to pronounce upon qualities I may or may not possess. Uh, however, as far as this particular question is concerned, one would suspect that the quality being referred to might most usefully be termed dignity. True. Mm, that's true. That, mind you, dignity's not just for gentlemen. Mm. Dignity's a thing we can all strive for and get. That's what we fought Hitler for. If Hitler had had his way, the whole world would be a few masters and millions and millions of slaves. There's no dignity to be had in being a slave. Surely, Mr. Smith, there is dignity in service. Ah, not if it's slavish, unthinking, doffing your cap to masters no matter what they do. What else was this war for but to put an end to masters and slaves? Mm. Having the right to an opinion and express it freely and vote in your member of parliament or vote him out, that's what being British is. I'm that. This village was hit hard by the war. We're only small, but a number of young lads we lost. Have you had much to do with politics yourself, sir? Not directly, as such, and particularly not these days. More so before the war. In fact, I tended to concern myself with international affairs more than domestic ones. Foreign policy, that is to say. I never held high office. Any influence I exerted was in a strictly unofficial capacity. Excuse me, but have you met Winston Churchill? <laughs> he came to the house on occasions, but uh, to be quite frank, during the time I was involved in great affairs, Mr Churchill was not such a key figure and was not expected to become one. <laughs> the likes of Mr Eden and Lord Halifax. Mr Eden? What's he like? He always seems to be a jolly decent fellow. I would say that, that is by and large accurate, but I have not seen Mr. Eden in recent years, and public life could change people unrecognisably in a few years. You could say that again. Look at Harry. Hey, <laughs> that's not fair. I do a lot of campaigning. I think it's the right thing to do. It's easy to forget our responsibility as citizens. I like to get folk thinking, to have opinions. You need to think in a democracy. It's what we fought for have our own minds and have our own say. Oh, here's the doctor now. Brandy, doctor. Shocking weather out there. Make it a double, Sid. <laughs> this here is Mr. Stevens. This is Dr. Carlyle. Oh, doctor, Mr. Stevens has been telling us about Churchill and Eden and... Oh, he knows them all. <laughs> really? You the chap of the car? <laughs> See, I said it was a small place. <laughs> Touring around for pleasure, Mr. Stevens? 
principally. Nice country round here. Delightful. And where are you from? Oxford. Ah, I have an uncle outside Oxford. Perhaps you know him. What was the name again? I wonder if you will excuse me. It's just that I'm very tired this evening. I've had a busy week. Oh, what a pity. I was looking forward to hearing more from you about Churchill and uh, Eden, was it? Another time, perhaps. I really am most tired. I have to make a visit to Stanbury first thing. I can give you a lift to your car. Save you the walk. It's no trouble. Thank you. That would be most helpful. Thank you, all of you. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Sleep well, sir. Good night, Mr. Stevens. I feel some discomfort on account of this unfortunate misunderstanding. I did not say I was a gentleman. They took me for one. And as for Harry Smith's pronouncements on the nature of dignity, they have little merit. How can ordinary people have opinions on all manner of things? I doubt it is even desirable. Why, to prove my case, I remember an occasion in 1935 when I was rung late at night in order to replenish refreshments. <laughs> oh, uh, Stevens, uh, Mr. Spencer insists on having a word with you. With me, sir? I have a question for you. Stevens, is it? Yes, sir. Would you say that the currency problem in Europe would be made better or worse if there were to be an arms agreement between the French and the Bolsheviks? <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, but I am unable to assist you in this matter. <laughs> it is not in my realm, sir. <laughs> then, <clears throat> uh, can you tell us what Monsieur Laval intended by his recent speech on the situation in North Africa? I, I think you've made your point, <laughs> Spencer, my dear chap. I'm sorry, sir, but I am unable to assist you in this matter. <laughs> then, surely, you can tell us if the debt situation regarding America is a significant factor in the present low levels of trade. I'm sorry, sir, but I am... Unable to assist you in this matter. <laughs> it, it is not in my realm, sir. No, it is not. It is quite beyond you, and rightly so. There, Darlington, my point is proved. And yet we persist with the notion that the nation's decisions be left in the hands of this good man and others like him. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> enough now, Spencer. You've had your sport. Thank you, Stevens. That will be all. You go too far, Spencer. Well, we're going to say it. The next morning, his lordship felt it necessary to apologise to me. Mr. Spencer had a point to prove about the will of the people being the wisest arbitrator and so on. I was not unduly inconvenienced, sir. We are so slow, Stevens. Germany and Italy have set their house in order, but look at us here. Endless members of Parliament debating things to a standstill, and year after year goes by and nothing gets better. I noticed then how his frame, always slender, had become alarmingly thin and somewhat misshapen. His hair white, his face somewhat haggard. These years were taking their toll on my master. The world is a complicated place. And the man in the street can't be expected to understand everything. And why should he? Indeed, sir. You put it well last night, Stevens, how was it? Sounding to the effect that it was not in your realm. Well, why should it be? Quite, sir. If a butler is of any worth, a time comes when he must say to himself, this employer embodies all that I find noble and admirable, I will serve him. This is not slavish. This is loyalty intelligently bestowed. And if time has suggested Lord Darlington's ideas to be misguided, then what of it? I served him. I confined myself to affairs within my own professional realm. Why then should I feel regret? Or shame? 
Dr. Carlyle kindly called by at 7.30 and drove me to my car. An intelligent and affable gentleman, as we parted, he dared to ask. I say, I hope you don't think me rude, but aren't you a manservant of some sort? I am indeed, sir. It was not my intention to deceive anyone, sir. Oh, no need to explain, old chap. It must be good to be mistaken for a lord now and then. Hope they didn't bore you with a lot of foolish gossip. The conversation tended to be earnest, and some very interesting viewpoints were expressed. Oh, you mean Harry Smith? Harry's always trying to work everybody up over various issues. But the truth is, people are happier best left alone. He had most strong feelings and seemed to believe a person's dignity rested on such things. And what do you think dignity's all about? I suspect it comes down to not removing one's clothes in public. Oh, good God! I suppose it does. <laughs> <laughs> I believe my remark was an example of bantering. And it surprised me as much as it would have pleased my new employer, Mr. Faraday. The Americans are most keen on bantering. No doubt the doctor and I could have talked further, but I was eager to get on. By afternoon, I would be in Little Compton and speaking once again to Miss Kenton. She has been much in my mind. But one memory preoccupies me, that of her crying immediately after receiving news of her aunt's death. That is to say, when I stood outside her door, having realized I had not offered my condolences. Uh, I believe I am confused and that this fragment of memory takes place on another evening months after the death of Miss Kenton's aunt. The evening, in fact, when young Mr. Cardinal, Lord Darlington's godson, turned up at Darlington Hall rather unexpectedly. Stevens, nice to see you again. You're looking well. And the young Mrs. Cardinal? She's very well. I think the phrase is blooming. Ah. <laughs> Do you remember when we had that little talk about the birds and the bees? Let me take your coat, sir. Fish and fowl and all living things. <laughs> what a palaver. Most amusing. Indeed, sir. I hope this is not too inconvenient a time to call, but I was in the area and I must finish my column. I work for the Daily Mirror now, you see. His lordship informed me so, sir. My godfather's none too happy about it, is he? Sees it as working for the enemy. I cannot say so. I was hoping to use the library. His lordship won't mind, eh? There's uh, nothing special on, is there? His lordship is expecting some gentleman to call after dinner. Who's that, then? I am afraid I cannot say, sir. No? No, sir. I'll hide in the library, then. Very good, sir. Mr. Cardinal is here, Miss Kenton. He will be requiring his usual room. I will see to it before I leave, Mr. Stevens. You are going out this evening, Miss Kenton? We did agree to this evening off a fortnight ago, Mr. Stevens. Of course, Miss Kenton. I beg your pardon. Uh, Mr. Stevens, I, I do have something to tell you. Yes, Miss Kenton? It concerns my acquaintance, who I am going to meet tonight. He's asked me to marry him. Indeed, Miss Kenton. That is very interesting. I'm still giving the matter some thought. Indeed. My acquaintance is to start a job in the West Country as of next month. I thought he should be informed. Indeed. Now, oh, if you would excuse me. At precisely 8.30, there came the sound of motor cars in the courtyard, and I showed the two very distinguished gentlemen quickly into the drawing room. Ten minutes later, I opened the door to Herr Ribbentrop, the German ambassador. Most impressive man. 
I took up my position in the hall and was not obliged to move from it for some two hours. It was towards the end of this time I became aware of Miss Kenton's presence. Mr. Stevens. You had a pleasant evening? I did. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. I am pleased to hear it. Are you interested in what took place, Mr. Stevens, between my acquaintance and I? Not at present, Miss Kenton. Events of global significance are taking place behind those doors. I have accepted my acquaintance's proposal. Is that so? I will serve out my notice, but if you are able to release me earlier, we would be grateful. I will do my best to release you at the earliest opportunity. After all these years, you have no more words to greet the news of my possible departure. You have my warmest congratulations, Miss Kenton. Did you know, Mr. Stevens, that you have been a very important figure for my fiancé and I? We often pass the time amusing ourselves with anecdotes of you. The way you pinch your nostrils when you pepper your food. That always gets him laughing. He's also rather fond of your pep talks to the staff. The way you cough to gain our attention. Please, Miss Kenton, <laughs> you disturb the gentleman. I've become quite expert at recreating them. I only have to do a few lines to have the pair of us in stitches. I say, Stevens. Would you fetch me more brandy? Please excuse me, Miss Kenton. Your brandy, sir. I know what's going on in there. Sir? Over in that room is the British Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary and the German Ambassador. Do you know what they're doing? I'm afraid not, sir. Aren't you curious? It is not my position to display curiosity about such matters. They are discussing the idea of His Majesty, no enemy of the Nazi Party himself, visiting Herr Hitler. I am not privy to their conversations, sir. The Germans have used Lord Darlington as a pawn for their propaganda tricks. I'm certain his lordship knows what he is doing. Herr Ribbentrop has been able to bypass the Foreign Office altogether. Who in their right mind can trust Hitler after the Rhineland? I am unable to assist you in this matter, sir. His lordship is out of his depth. Don't you know this? His lordship is all that is noble and admirable. That is all I know, sir. And all such a one as myself needs to know. That's your idea of loyalty? I appear to be required by the gentleman. Please excuse me. Aren't you curious at all? Don't you care? I care only for his lordship, and I do that best by serving him faithfully. All else is beyond my realm, sir, if you will excuse me, sir. His lordship had instructed me to bring up a certain exceptionally fine bottle of port from the cellar. As I was making my way along the darkness of the corridor, the door to Miss Kenton's parlour opened, and she appeared on the threshold, illuminated by the light within. Miss Stevens, I was foolish earlier. I have not the time to talk now, Miss Kenton. I, I was simply being foolish. Events of great importance are unfolding upstairs, and I cannot stop to exchange pleasantries with you. I suggest you retire for the night. With that, I hurried on. It did not take me long to locate the bottle in question, and it was only a few minutes later that I found myself passing Miss Kenton's door. I saw the light seeping around its edges, and as I stood there, I heard Miss Kenton crying. I do not know how long I remained standing there. It, it seemed a significant period, but in reality, it was only a matter of a few seconds. I returned to my post. I had managed to preserve my dignity. Yes, my dignity. Miss Kenton was gone by the end of the week. Years pass, and I have finally arrived at Little Compton. My appointment with Miss Kenton is at three o'clock in the lounge of the Rose Hotel. Ah, oh, Mr. Stevens. Mrs. Ben. How nice to see you. 
You are looking well. In truth, she did. Outside, the rain fell, and the light in which we sat was dim. But she was the Miss Kenton of old. Slower, yes, or faded, certainly. And sadder, I believe, but unchanged. I was most distressed to hear of the breakdown of your marriage. Then please, Mr. Stevens, don't be. Forgive me, but from your letter, it seemed to be in quite a parlous state. And so it was. I left him, Mr. Stevens, for a period of four days. And then I returned home. Uh -huh. I was always, you know, something of a coward. Mr. Ben will be pleased to have you back. It's just as well one of us is sensible about these things. My daughter Catherine lives in Dorset. She is expecting her first child in the autumn. A grandchild? Mm. You and Mr. Ben must be very pleased. Yes. On your return, you could call on her. She would like that. She knows all about you, for often I talk of those days at Darlington Hall. How was his lordship at the end? He was most upset at the death of young Mr. Cardinal in Belgium. And the libel case? After the war, I read of it in the newspaper. The newspapers were not kind to him. They said terrible things about him. He bore it all the while the country was in peril, but once the war was over and the insinuations continued, he sought justice and was denied it. His good name was destroyed forever. He became an invalid. I would take him tea in the drawing room and... Well, it was really most tragic to see. Time is seldom kind to any of us. Shall we order tea? Ah. <laughs> this is the most that was said between us of poor Lord Darlington. Predominantly, we concerned ourselves with happy memories. Two hours we spent together, two extremely pleasant ones. They passed oh. so quickly. Mr. Stevens, it has been so very pleasant. And there are a thousand and one things I have yet to ask and say, but really, I must go. Must you? Yes, Mr. Stevens, I am afraid I must. Then, let me drive you home. I have Mr. Faraday's car. It is a Ford. Oh, dear me, no, Mr. Stevens. I have a return ticket for the bus. What would Mr. Ben say if I arrived home in such a flashy American car? Oh, very well. He's always ribbing me about the grand airs he believes I acquired at Darlington Hall. Then let me walk you to your bus. I have an umbrella, and I would very much like to prolong our time together. Of course, Mr. Stevens. That would be very pleasant. The bus should be here very soon. It is most dependable. If the weather were more fair, I would suggest a walk by the pier. There is a fairground, too, that is quite charming. Mr. Stevens, what are you smiling about? Oh, nothing, Miss Kenton. Oh, Mr. Stevens, you really must tell me. Well, I was recalling how in one of your letters you wrote... Uh, let me see. The rest of my life stretches out like an emptiness before me. Some words to that effect. Really, Mr. Stevens? I assure you, you did. Well, there are days when my life seems to stretch out in emptiness before me, but really, you know, it does not. Well, for one thing, we are looking forward to our grandchild. Yes, that will be splendid for you. <sighs> And what does the future hold for you? Oh, there is work, and there is work, and, and there, there is more is work. More work. <laughs> <laughs> My employer, Mr. Faraday, would be surprised at our laughter. He does not think I banter enough. 
It is not one of your many skills, but I am sure he appreciates all the others you no doubt still display. Please forgive me, Miss Kempton, but... You keep calling me oh, Miss Kempton. I'm so sorry. I mean... No, Miss... it is quite all right, really, Mr. Stevens. It is pleasant to know that to someone somewhere I am still Miss Kenton. The letters I have had from you over the years, and the last one in particular, they suggest that you are... How might one put it? Rather unhappy. I simply wondered if you were being mistreated in some way. My husband does not mistreat me. He is not a cruel or ill-tempered man. It is true that I have left him some three times now. I suppose you are asking, Mr. Stevens, whether or not I love my husband. I did not. Not for a long time. When I left Darlington Hall, I never realised I was truly leaving. I thought of it simply as another ruse to annoy you, Mr. Stevens. <laughs> For a long time, I, I was very unhappy. Then there was the war. Catherine grew up, and, and one day I realised I loved my husband. That doesn't mean to say that there aren't occasions now and then desolate occasions when I get to thinking about a different life a better life I might have led a life I might have lived with you but one can't be forever dwelling on what might have been can one Mr. Stevens I do not think I responded immediately for her words their implications were such as to provoke within me a certain degree of sorrow. Indeed, why should I not admit it? At that moment, my heart was breaking. <sighs> you must look to the future. What with grandchildren and Mr. Ben retiring, these may be your happiest years. You must do all you can to make yourself happy, Mrs. Ben. We may never meet again, so I would ask you to take good heed of what I am saying. And your future, Mr. Stevens, what of that? I gave my best to Lord Darlington. I gave him the very best I had to give. And now, well, I find I do not have a great deal more to give. Since my new employer arrived, I've tried very hard, very hard indeed, but I find I fall short. More and more errors appear in my work. Mr. Stevens, I... Lord Darlington was not a bad man. At least at the end of his life, he could say he made his own mistakes. He chose his own path, a misguided one, but he chose it. I cannot even claim that. I can't even say I made my own mistakes. Really, Miss Kenton, what dignity is there in that? I don't know what to say. You must catch your bus, Mrs. Ben. Mr. Stevens, perhaps I should repeat what you said to me. Look to your own future. You've done your day's work. Make the best of what remains. Goodbye, Mr. Stevens. Goodbye, Miss Kent. It has been so nice to see you. So very nice. Yes, it has been most pleasant. The sky over the sea is a pale red, and they have switched on the lights of the pier. The day is ending. The evening is the most enjoyable part of the day. I should adopt a more positive outlook. What can we gain in forever looking back and blaming ourselves if our lives have not turned out quite as we wished? 
What is the point in worrying oneself too much about what one could or could not have done to control the course one's life has taken? Surely it is enough to try to make a small contribution count for something true and worthy. Surely that in itself is cause for pride and contentment. I look at the people gathered about me. I thought they were friends at first, but they are strangers to each other, I believe. Curious how people build such warmth among themselves. I fancy it has to do with the skill of bantering. Perhaps it is time to look at the matter of bantering more enthusiastically. Is it such a foolish thing to indulge in, if it is the case that in bantering lies the key to human warmth? Perhaps I will begin practicing, and on my employer's return, pleasantly surprise him. <laughs>